bright duty every student matters and as a result the british again tries to have certain compromises with the indian leaders and we see the crips mission arrive in india in the year 1942 in the spring of 1942 churchill was persuaded to send one of his minister sir stafford crips to india to try to forge a compromise with gandhi ji and with other indian political leaders so this missions are sent to reach a compromise because now british feel that they will need indian support in the world war efforts and the crips mission arrives in india in 1942 talks broke down however after the congress insisted that if it was to help the british defend india from axis powers then the viceroy had forced to appoint an indian as the defense member in his executive council so the demand which is kept forward by the indian side is that they need to have an indian member in the defense council so from the indian side the demand kept forward is that an indian should be there as the defense member in the executive council so now again the british is not ready to accept this demand and as a result the talk breaks down so the failure of the crips mission spread a wave of anger in the country so indians were really disappointed and angry when again british disregarded or rejected their demands gandhi ji decided to launch his third major movement against the british this was the quit india movement so now comes the third big movement so first as you know it's the non cooperation movement which gandhi ji launched in 1920 to make the british accept the demands on the indian side and then came the civil disobedience movement launched in 1930 again to make the british hear to the indian voice and then came the third major national movement which was the quit india movement and it gets launched in the year 1942 and the quit india movement was to become a mass struggle on non violent lines under the leadership of gandhi ji so like the other two movements this was also along non violent lines that that this movement was to be taken forward and under the leadership of gandhi however we see that before the congress could start the movement the government was quick to let loose a reign of terror again there was suppression and violence from the side of the british government on 9th august gandhi ji and other congress leaders were arrested there was imprisonment of the major congress leaders but the younger activists organized demonstrations and hartals that is protest in factories schools colleges and in all parts of the country so although all the senior and significant members of the congress were arrested we see that the young congress members and other citizens so the young congress members and other common people took the initiative and led the fight against the british during the quit india movement particularly active in the underground resistance were socialist members of the congress 
such as J. Prakash Narayan and Ram Manohar Lohia. So the socialist members who were working underground because the party as such was also banned by the British and its activities were banned. So they were forced to go underground. But they, these members were also playing a major role during the Quit India movement. Like the Jay Prakash, like Jay Prakash Narayan and Ram Manohar Lohia. In some districts such as Satara in west and Midnapur in the east, independent governments were proclaimed. So in the same period in certain parts of the country, independent governments are also being declared. The movement took the form of a violent outbreak. The government succeeded in crushing the movement, yet it took more than a year to suppress the rebellion. So here again, like what happened in the non-cooperation movement, this movement also takes a violent turn, which then the government uses as a tool to suppress the movement. But even after the separation, we see that it took more than a year to suppress the rebellion. Now we look at the characteristic features of mass movements which Gandhi led. The Quit India movement was truly a mass movement. It brought into its ambit thousands of ordinary people. So it became a mass movement because it brought into it thousands of ordinary people and it made those ordinary people participate in the struggle. It especially energized the young who in large numbers left their colleges to go to jails. So the young members of the society left or boycotted their schools and colleges to participate in the struggle against the British. It brought the nationalist feelings among the youth to such a stage that the day was not far off when the British would have to quit India. So all the members, especially the youth and the young generation, was in so much of spirit that the day was not far off when the British had to really quit India and leave India forever. And now we see following the Quit India movement, the freedom struggle becomes all the more active between the year 1944 to 47. And in June 1944, when the end of the war was in sight, the government released Gandhiji from jail. So Gandhi, as we saw, was arrested in 1942. And in 44, after the suppression of the Quit India movement, Gandhi gets released. And later in 1944, Gandhiji held a series of meetings with Mr. Jinnah in order to bridge the gap between the Congress and the Muslim League. So now he focuses on bridging or taking off the gap between Congress and the Muslim League. And after the end of war in 1945, the Labour government came to power in Britain. It had committed itself to grant independence to India. So after the First World War, the Labour Party, which was in rule in Britain, commits itself to granting of independence to India. In India, Lord Wavell, the Viceroy of India, brought the Congress and the League together for a series of talks at Shimla. So now the Viceroy, Lord Wavell, is also bringing the Congress and the League together in Shimla. But the talks ended in a failure on 14th June 1945. But these talks also become ineffective and breaks down by 14th June 1945. Early in 1946, fresh elections were held in the provinces. So another election takes place in the province by 1946. The Congress swept the general category seats in the provincial legislatures, but in the seats reserved for Muslims, 
the league won a thumping majority. So, in the general category seats, we see that Congress won all the seats, but in the seats which were reserved for Muslims, it was won by the Muslim League and it led to a political polarization which was then complete. So, this Muslims in one part and the Congress winning in the other led to complete polarization of the society or division of society on communal lines. In the summer of 1946, the British government sent a cabinet mission. So, this is after the Crips mission, another mission which arrives in India is the cabinet mission to hold talks with Indian leaders about the terms for the transfer of power to Indians. So, now the topic of discussion and the agenda is to talk about the terms for the transfer of power. How is the transfer of power from British government to the Indians will happen? It failed to get the Congress and the League to agree on a federal system that would keep India together while allowing the provinces a degree of autonomy. So, again the League and Congress failed to come to an agreement. After the talks failed, Jinnah decided to start direct action to achieve Pakistan. So, after the failure of the cabinet mission to bring an agreement between Congress and Muslim League, we see that Jinnah launches the direct action to demand a separate state for Muslims that is Pakistan. And here Jinnah raised the slogan divide and quit, meaning that the British should partition the country and quit. That was what the demand of Jinnah was, divide and quit. And he fixed 16th August as the day of observance of direct action. So, the 16th August is called the Direct Action Day, demanding a separate state for Muslims. On this day, violence broke out in Kolkata and Silhat. The violence spread to rural Bengal and Bihar. It further separate, it further spread across the Uttar Pradesh and Punjab. So, all over the country there was violence. In some places, Muslims were the main sufferers, that is Muslims were mainly attacked by the majority community, while in others, the Hindus became the victims. So, both Hindus and Muslims were equally the victims of such a violence. In February 1947, Lord Mountbatten was appointed the Governor General of India. Mountbatten called one last round of talks, the Indian political leaders, but these talks also failed. So, Mountbatten called for one last round of talks between Indian political leaders on both the sides, but very sadly, there was no outcome of this too. Under such circumstances, the British India would be free but also divided. So, because of no compromise being reached between these two parties, the only option now left was to divide India. And the date of transfer of power was fixed for 15th August. On that day, it was celebrated with gusto in different parts of India. So, this 15th August was a day which was a day of celebration but also of great pain and tragedy because the great country was getting divided into two. In Delhi, there was prolonged applause when Dr. Rajendra Prasad, the President of the Constituent Assembly, began the meeting by invoking the father of nation, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. So, Gandhi was invoked by the President of the Constituent Assembly, Rajendra Prasad, who was then appointed as the President of Indian Union and he began a speech by 
कंग्रेचुलेटिंग और अपलोडिंग कंग्रेचुलेटिंग और गिविंग रिगार्ड टू गांधी आउटसाइड द असेंबली थाउजेंड ऑफ इंडियंस शाउटेड महात्मा गांधी की जय सो अलोंग विद लीडर्स admitting the great efforts of gandhi common people were also singing praises of gandhi on the day of independence now we look into the gandhi's last heroic days or the last phase in life of gandhi so gandhi ji was not present in the capital when the people were celebrating the advent of freedom on 15th august 1947 he was at calcutta but he did not attend any function or hoist a national flag either he marked the event with a 24 hour fast so to our dismay gandhi was on a fast when india was getting independence the freedom for which he had fought a long battle had come to an unprecedented cost with a nation divided and hindus and muslims at each other's throat and the reason why gandhi was sad and in pain because the freedom which he had fought for in all these years had come with a great cost that is it had to be achieved through the division of the country and the violence between hindus and muslims so we see gandhi's biographer D H G Tendulkar who writes throughout October and September that is 1947 Gandhi ji went around hospitals and refugee camps giving consolation to the distressed people that is consoling those who were affected by the violence which was taking place all over the country he fervently appeal to the sikhs the hindus the muslims to forget the past and not to dwell on their sufferings so he was appealing to all the sections to forget the past and to forget the enmity and anger but to the extent the right hand of fellowship to each other to determine to live in peace so he was asking everyone to make the determination to forget the past and begin a new life which was peace and brotherhood and in gandhi's and nehru's initiative the congress now passed a resolution on the rights of minorities the congress had always opposed the two nations theory and was forced against its will to accept partition of the country so again when the partition happened we see that congress is against it it is opposing it it never wanted the country to be divided but the situation was such that there was no other option but to divide it still firmly believed that india is a land of many religions and many races and must remain so pakistan may have made islam a state religion but india would be a democratic secular state where all citizens enjoy full rights and equally entitled to the protection of the state irrespective of the religion to which they belong so now after independence india decides to remain a secular state that is a country without a state religion and the decision to treat all religions as equal and the congress was anxious to assure the minorities in india that is people belonging to different religious beliefs and sects that congress was assuring these minorities that it will continue to protect the best of its ability their citizen rights against aggression so during the eve of independence congress took the initiative to assure the minorities that their constitutional right to freedom and equality will always be protected and we see that how gandhi was disappointed and in pain 
during the day of independence and he was in fast when the nation was celebrating independence because he was saddened by the fact that india was getting divided and there was violence all over so after independence gandhi worked to bring peace to bengal and to the other parts of the nation where there was hindu muslim fights and conflicts going on and next he shifted to delhi from where he wished to visit the right infected districts of punjab and then he went to delhi and from there to punjab to see closely what sufferings people were going through while at delhi his meetings were disrupted by the refugees so a lot of people were getting displaced from pakistan and from india and they were made homeless thus they became refugees and gandhi's meetings were getting disrupted and interventions were happening when the refugees approached gandhi delhi itself was badly affected by the communal riots the conflicts had affected the regions in and around delhi and in the middle of january 1948 gandhi ji in delhi again undertook a fast to bring about communal harmony so the focus of gandhi after independence was to bring communal harmony and to appeal everyone to forget the bitter past where there was violence and killings and to lay the foundations of a society where there was social and communal harmony peace love and brotherhood these were the values which gandhi wanted everyone to believe in and stand for so now gandhi at the eve of independence we see that although he is disappointed he feels that the worst was over that indians would henceforth work collectively for the equality of all classes and creeds never the domination or superiority of the major community over a minority community however insignificant it may be in numbers and influence so he said that the worst is over although the partition took place now we will live in social harmony and no kind of majority domination will ever happen or over the minority community and he also hoped that though geographically and politically india is divided into two at heart we shall ever be friends and brothers helping and respecting one another and be one for the outside world so he still held hope that although india is divided and there are separate states we will still have love and good feelings for each other and live as siblings however we see that even when gandhi was appealing for peace and social harmony there were some sections within india who were less forgiving and who were opposing and was this and was in disagreement with gandhi's views on january 30th 1948 10 days after his last fast gandhi ji was fatally shot by one such hindu fanatic when gandhi was walking to his daily prayer meeting at the house where he was residing in delhi so those sections who were opposing the views of gandhi and his appeal for peace they attacked gandhi and on january 30th 1948 finally they succeeded in their mission when they shot gandhi the assassin was a brahmin from pune named nathuram godse he is the one who was responsible for killing gandhi and he was an editor of an extremist hindu newspaper who had denounced gandhi ji as an appeaser of muslims so the reason which was given by the assassin of gandhi was he was a muslim appeaser 
whatever gandhi did was to please the minority sections and he did not pay attention to the majority community and its needs and we see that gandhi's death cast a gloom over the country each and every individual was in disappointment and was in pain at hearing the death of gandhi each and every individual was pained by hearing the news of the death of gandhi rich tributes were paid to him from across the political spectrum in india and moving tributes were coming from international figures like george orwell who as a author and albert einstein the great scientist so from india and abroad and from international community we saw that tributes were flowing in for gandhi and now we see at a gist of what gandhi stood for and what mark his life has on the world now so gandhi wanted to bring a transformation in human society he wanted humans to undergo a change and he aimed to substitute violence or coercion that is force as the dominant criteria of human life by the supremacy of self suffering love so gandhi gave importance to the power of self suffering love over violence and he dreamt of a non violent society so the dream of gandhi was to build the foundations of a society where each person was sensitive to the needs of the other and loved them selflessly and it is essential to develop an integral spiritual outlook before one can have this kind of society so to have this non violent society and selfless love it is important to have a spiritual outlook towards life and he stressed peace modesty gentleness philanthropy that is helping the other and a sense of devout respect for the religious views of the other so important to lay down the foundations of a non violent community or society was to have respect and regard for people who are different from us people who are in a different religion people who come from a different cultural background people who come from a different geographical background you have to regard them and give them respect and consider them gandhi ji expanded the age old wisdom of asia by incorporating truth and non violence chastity and social justice so into the age old spiritual wisdom of asia gandhi brought in truth non violence chastity and social justice such values were added into the life of south asians by gandhi so when we learn about life of gandhi it is important to see those personalities or individuals who at some point or the other were having disagreements with gandhi or had disagreements and differing approaches from what gandhi thought so one of them was the great dalit re- leader and uh so one of them was the great dalit leader dr b r ambedkar he had certain disagreements with gandhi and one of them was about terming the dalit or the oppressed community as harijans or children of god gandhi had given dalits the term harijan which meant the children of god and ambedkar considered it as something which made dalits socially immature and the privileged class indians a paternalistic role so for ambedkar calling them with such names made them socially immature and it gave the elite or the upper caste indians a paternalistic role that is role of a father figure who could then take decisions on behalf of the dalit 
and Dr. Ambedkar and his allies or friends said that it was undermining Dalit political rights. So another problem which Ambedkar felt uh, it was there with the name Harijan was it undermined or kind of did not regard Dalit's political rights and its assertion. Gandhiji, although born into a family of Vaishya caste, which was an upper caste, insisted that he was able to speak on behalf of Dalits, that is untouchables, despite the opposition of Dalit activists like Ambedkar. So, although Ambedkar was saying that such upper caste people can never understand what a Dalit undergoes, Gandhi said that he was having the capacity to understand the plight of the Dalits and talk on their behalf. So, another critique of Gandhi was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was the Muslim League leader and he had condemned Gandhi for undermining Muslim political rights. So, the reason why Jinnah opposed Gandhi was he felt that he undermined or did not give enough attention to the Muslim political rights. Hindu Mahasabha leaders like Veer Savarkar and his allies condemned Gandhiji, accusing him of politically appeasing Muslims while turning a blind eye to their atrocities against Hindus and for allowing the creation of Pakistan. So now another set of uh, leaders who are opposing Gandhi comes from uh, the Hindu nationalist section like the Veer Savarkar and his followers who felt that he was a Muslim appeaser and we saw that the killer of Gandhi Godse had also said the same thing that he that Gandhi had always appeased or stood in support of Muslims and he go and he gave a blind and he turned a blind eye towards the needs of the majority community that is hindus though gandhi had publicly declared that before partitioning india my body will have to be cut into two pieces as a rule gandhi ji was opposed to the concept of partition as it contradicted his vision of unity so now when his critics are holding Gandhi responsible for the partition of the country, we must remind ourselves that Gandhi had said, before partitioning, I would prefer to have my body to be cut into two pieces. So he was to this extent against partition of the nation. Even when critics say that the efforts or the policies which Gandhi adopted to an extent was responsible for dividing the country. So another criticism which is then raised against Gandhi is that Gandhi came under political fire for his intolerance to those young men who attempted to achieve independence through more violent means. So there was a section in Indian society who did not feel that non-violence can help us reach our destination, that is freedom. So they took course in violent measures to free India from the British rule. But Gandhi never supported such efforts. And in this we see that Gandhi had refused to protest against hanging of Shaheed Bhagat Singh, Subdev, Rajguru and Sardar Uddham Singh. So, when the British were hanging uh, these revolutionary leaders, the critics say that Gandhi never asked to repeal such death punishment and Gandhi never requested on behalf of these young leaders. And economists like Jagdish Bhagwati have criticized Gandhiji's ideas of Sodeshi, trusteeship and Ram Rajya. So, for this economist named Jagdish Bhagwati, the Gandhi's ideas of Sodeshi, trusteeship and Ram Raj were also problematic.
Some writers have interpreted statements made by Gandhi as offensive. So, for some other sections or the critics, the statements which Gandhi made at times were offensive or not acceptable. And especially in regard to the black South Africans, he used the term kafir. So, this word is termed as a derogatory term and Gandhi's use of the term kafir to refer to black South Africans is considered by certain critics as an offensive term. So, but it must be noted that during Gandhi's time, the term kafir had a different connotation than its present day usage. So, even when critics are claiming that Gandhi used such derogatory terms, we should also remember that such a term had a different meaning when Gandhi was using it. And he didn't essentially use it as a term to insult the South, to insult the black South Africans. So, another critique, uh, Koinard Els, who is an Indologist, also criticized Gandhi. He questioned the effectiveness of Gandhi's he questioned the effectiveness of Gandhi's theory of non-violence and argued that it achieved only a few token concessions from British. So, this theory of non-violence according to Coinard Els was not an effective measure. And Coinard Els also argues that it was the British fear of violence rather than non-violence that led to Indian independence. So, for him, non-violence did not play any effective role. Instead, it was the fear which British had against violence that led to the freeing of India. And according to Els, this was exemplified by Indian public support for Subhash Chandra Bodh's Indian National Army. So, the support which Indians had given Subhash Chandra Bodh's INA clearly shows that they at times preferred violent measures over what Gandhi preached as non-violence. And the other section like Marxist academicians like Aisha Jalal have blamed Gandhi and Congress for being unwilling to share power with Muslims and thus hastening partition. So, for another section of scholars, it was Congress and Gandhi who were not ready to share power with the Muslim League, which as a result led to the partition of the country. So, now we look at newspapers and what kind of an image we get of Gandhi from newspapers. So, one of the important sources of information about the life and activities of Gandhi are the contemporary newspapers, that is the newspapers which is released then, newspapers published in English and different Indian languages such as Gujarati, Marathi, Bengali and Hindi. Both the regional and the national newspapers to a large extent gives us certain image of Gandhi and information about his life and ideology. And it also represented what Indians thought of Gandhi. So, what was the image of Gandhi in the mind of Indians could also to an extent be found in the newspapers. These were published by those who had their own political opinions and worldviews. But one has to keep in mind that newspapers will also have their own agendas because it has been published by the sections of the society with certain interest of theirs. These ideas shape the opinion of ordinary Indians. But the accounts published in London newspapers were different from the reports published in Indian national newspapers and magazines. So, here again the ones published in Indian newspapers and the ones coming from Britain, the news which was there on Gandhi and what image he had in the minds of people sometimes varied or contradicted each other. So, now we come to the concluding part of the chapter and here we look at 
how different sections in the society and different personalities or individuals have given an image of Gandhi or what kind of tributes Gandhi has received from different individuals. So, Dr. Vishwanath Prasad Varma rightly remarks, humanity will have to turn to his teachings, that is the teachings of the Gandhi, if the devastation of civilization is to be avoided. So, if you have to avoid the civilization going into destruction, we will have to go back to the teachings of Gandhi. That is what Dr. Vishwanath Prasad Varma says. So, it is true that the communal murders perpetrated from 1946 to 47 in Bengal, Bihar and Punjab on an enormous scale indicated that India had not taken the Gandhian teachings to the heart. So, the violence was a clear sign that although Gandhi preached non-violence all throughout his life, somewhere Indians had failed to completely live on those lines. Indians had taken to non-violent resistance against the British because they were helpless against British might. And to an extent we could say that Indians had no other option but to use non-violent or non-violent uh, measures because the British were so powerful. But they had not cultivated non-violence of the brave. So, this is what Gandhi says that non-violence is not the weapon of the weak but of the brave because it is very difficult to practice non-violence. Regardless of this failure of Indians to stick to Gandhian teachings, there was no cause of despair. Gandhi had an invincible faith in the nobility of human nature. So, although there were failures from the side of Indians and many a times Indians went into violent measures, still to a large extent the teachings of Gandhi had a real effect on the minds of Indians and their struggle for freedom. And now we look at the tributes which individuals have given to Gandhi, praising his life and his efforts. So, the first is Albert Einstein, the great scientist who said, Gandhi, the great political genius of our time, gave a proof of what sacrifice man is capable once he has discovered the right path. His work on behalf of India's liberation is living testimony to the fact that man's will sustained by an indomitable conviction is more powerful than material forces. So, here Albert Einstein is talking about the great contributions which Gandhi has given to humanity, not only Indians, to, but to the world all over. Another scholar, Romain Roland, says that Mahatma Gandhi has raised up 300 million of his fellow men, shaken the British Empire and inaugurated in human politics, the most powerful movement that the whole world has seen for nearly 2000 years. So, here Roman Rowland also is showing his respect and great regard to Gandhi and the great fight he had put up against the British. Sir Stafford Cripp says, there has been no great spiritual leader in the world in our own times. So, for Stafford Cripps, who had headed the Crips mission, he says that there is no great spiritual leader in the world in our own times other than Gandhi. And according to Dr. S. Radhakrishnan, great teacher appears once in a while. Several centuries may pass by without the advent of such a one, that by which he is nation in his life. His, he first lives and then tells others how they may live likewise. Such a teacher was Gandhi. So, for S. Radhakrishnan, Gandhi was a great teacher who appears only once in a while. Such great learned teachers 
appear in human life very rarely and he calls him the great teacher who first showed us how to live and lived by those principles and set an example through his life for us so now after concluding by the tributes which gandhi received from various individuals from different walks of life we have concluded this chapter so as the chapter name suggests uh we know it was about the life and times of gandhi ji we started with the first phase of gandhi's life his early childhood and uh, other details of it and from there we went on to see how gandhi as an adult lived in south africa and how he took up the problems which africans the south african indian immigrants were facing there and how he emerged as a leader of indian immigrants in south africa and from there we saw how in 1915 gandhi returns back to india and gets involved in the political developments of india and how by 1920 he becomes a mass leader by launching non cooperation movement and its great success leads to uh his image becoming all the more big and then how in the 1930s he again launches a national movement that is civil disobedience movement and how the salt satyagraha becomes the most effective tool to do that and from there in 1942 how the quit india movement is launched again by gandhi and what all effects it has on the indian population and the british government and then we concluded with the last days of gandhi and how different sections in the society uh criticized him for certain measures of his and for some he is held responsible for the division of the nation but we still need to see how he held on to the values of truth brotherhood and social harmony and how it has shaped our nation and each one of us so after looking at all these aspects now we have a set of questions also to understand and think about so we will now discuss some of those questions so there are some short answer questions like write the name of satyagraha associated with bihar and then you know the answer is champaran it was the first satyagraha movement launched by gandhi and when did mahatma gandhi return from south africa so it was in 1915 that he returned back to india from south africa another question is who formed the swaraj party so it was motilal nehru and c r das who are credited as the members or the founders of the swaraj party in which congress session was complete independence resolution passed it was in lahore session in 1929 that complete independence or purna swaraj was passed where did the congress hold its annual session in december 1929 and it was lahore session on what date was independence day observed you know the date 15th august 1947 and bardoli movement belonged to whom it was peasants led movement kheda is situated in which state it was in gujarat that the district of kheda is there so another question is how was mahatma gandhi perceived by the peasants so for the peasants they thought that gandhi had many qualities of a great man and the title of the mahatma or great soul was conferred upon him by the people so for the people he was a great soul so now we look at questions on influences on gandhi's ideology what all are the factors that are influencing gandhi's ideology what did bhagavad gita teach gandhi ji so we know it is to render selfless service to humanity 
What was the influence of David Thoreau on Gandhi? From David Thoreau, Gandhi had borrowed the idea of civil disobedience. So this is the great contribution which David Thoreau uh, has for Ga Gandhi. Another question is, why did Gandhiji establish Sabarmati Ashram near Ahmedabad in 1915? So here Gandhi had settled with a little group of men who had accepted his general principles and they wanted to try out the methods of simple collective life that Gandhi had begun in South Africa without restrictions of class, creed and caste. So in order to live a life without restrictions of class, creed and caste and to live a collective life that Gandhi had established the ashram at Sabarmati. Describe the principles of truth and non-violence preached by Mahatma Gandhi. So we see that Gandhi had firm faith in truth and non-violence and he said that non-violence was the guiding principle of mankind. It was the creed of brave and not of the cowards. Truth is God. The nearest approach to truth is through love and non-violence. Next question is, how did Mahatma Gandhi seek to identify with common people? So, we see that Gandhi moved from village to village, visiting every part of the country. This was one of the way to connect with common people. And he also dressed like a common villager and spoke to them in the common Indian language. So, which made Gandhi connect to people very strongly. Next question is, in what way did Mahatma Gandhi transform the nature of national movement and how he emerges as a mass leader? So, here... Gandhi's tours made the teeming millions of Indian villagers politically more conscious than ever. The demand for national government from the level of middle class agitations was what was happening before and Gandhi made Congress a popular movement which could not be resisted by the government. So something which was limited to the middle class is now being expanded to the lower sections of the society. And he made Indian villagers politically more conscious. And this is how Gandhi transformed the nature of national movement. So now we look at questions on non-cooperation movement. Uh, one question is, how was non-cooperation a form of protest? So this is a long answer question. So you will have to bring in all the aspects of non-cooperation into it. So non-cooperation movement brought common people into the political struggle, that is the biggest contribution of it and it created a spirit of self-confidence and self-reliance among people and it captured the imagination of people and the whole nation rose as one man. So there was a collective bonding of people with each other and many distinguished lawyers and Muslim leaders and sections of different Different sections of society participated in this movement. Many students gave up studying in school, in government schools and colleges. Many national educational institutions were also started during this time. And the takla and charka appeared in every home and became symbols of movement. And liquor shops and foreign clothes shops were often picketed. So these are the uh, forms in which non-cooperation had emerged as a form of protest and which laid the foundations of the unification of different sections of the society. Another question on non-cooperation is, analyze the circumstances favoring the adoption of non-cooperation movement by Gandhi. So what are the circumstances which are favoring the adoption of non-cooperation? So Mahatma Gandhi felt that giving support to the Khilafat movement was an opportunity to establish cordial relations between Muslims and Hindus. So the support which was given to the Khilafat movement was a base for building up Hindu-Muslim unity. This led to an alliance between Congress and Muslim League. So the Congress and Muslim League which always had varying opinions is now coming together uh, under this issue of Khilafat 
and Mahatma Gandhi was soon recognized as the leader of Hindus as well as Muslims. So with, with this unity between Hindus and Muslims, we see that Mahatma Gandhi had emerged as a leader of both the sections. The All India Khilafat Committee under the leadership of Maulana Azad in May 1920 adopted the non-cooperation movement to fight against the British. And in May 1920, it is the All India Khilafat Committee which takes leadership to adopt non-cooperation movement and Gandhiji was the first to plunge into the movement and lead it. So, in this situation when a Hindu-Muslim unity is getting forged and the political situation uh, is feasible for launching a fight against British, that Gandhi launches this movement and leads the non-cooperation movement from the forefront. There are some questions on civil disobedience movement. So, one is, why did Mahatma Gandhi start civil disobedience movement? Briefly describe Mahatma Gandhi's Dandi March or Salt Satyagraha. So, it's in the Lahore session in December 1929 that Congress had declared full independence. Under Gandhi's leadership, it was soon resolved that the government would not make any promise of immediate grant of self-government. So, the British government had denied the Indian demand for self-government. So, then the Congress were then launching a new campaign for non-violent dis civil disobedience and Gandhi was given the charge for this movement of civil disobedience. And Gandhi adopted a quite new and effective method to fight the government. On March 11, 1930, after previous notice to the Viceroy, Gandhi along with his 79 selected and trusted followers started from Sabamati Ashram to Dandi, a village on the sea coast of Gujarat. And in the morning of 6th April, he violated the salt laws which signaled the beginning of countrywide waves of civil disobedience. So, this is how the Dandi March or the Salt Satyagraha gets launched and happens. And the question is, why did the salt laws become an important issue of struggle? So, the salt is most necessary article of the common man's food. The government doubled the duty on salt and also prevented the making of salt from seawater. Gandhi hoped that he would get the biggest support from the masses by breaking the salt law because it was commonly used by all the sections of the society and it became an important issue of struggle for Gandhi. Why was Charka chosen as a symbol of nationalism? So, Gandhi was profoundly critical of the modern age in which machines enslaved humans and displaced labor. He saw the Charka as a symbol of a human society that would not glorify machines and technology. The spinning wheel moreover could provide the poor with supplementary income and make them self-reliant. These are the factors which leads Gandhi to use Charka as a symbol of nationalism. 